morning, everybody. Um, my name is Jan Pretorius. Um, I'm basically a trauma surgeon from Johannesburg. I'm working in uh, Chris Hani Barabona Hospital. And I'm also in a private um, sector, also working in Mortbar Hospital. Now, the, um, obviously, we start with me first because it's probably the less academic of all of it, so you can then relax and just listen to it. Um, I can only speak Afrikaans and English. I can't speak Greek. So if I sound, if I speak Greek, then stop me because then I'm talking too fast. And you must just slow me down. So the role of a trauma surgeon is quite hard, hard to explain to everybody what is the role of a trauma surgeon because you know in in different um, sectors there's especially in Europe like um, in Europe like the role of a trauma surgeon I mean in some places orthopedic surgeons are trauma surgeons and in some places it's um, general surgeons and then you get anesthesiologists or um, whoever who actually also do the resuscitation so in, in our setting I can give you a reflection of what we do and also how it differs from our different settings that we've got. Speciality now in South Africa for probably the last two, to, uh, probably the last five years. And what you do is you do basically a two year, after you've done your fellowship in surgery, you do another two years that you actually super specialize in trauma and critical care. A large part of it is because also to do a critical <coughs> care to take care of your patients afterwards. And the role of the trauma surgeon is initial resuscitation and stabilization. That's what we do. Um, we basically are in charge of the patient and then we basically make sure that the patient is stable. Then we start pulling out all the other specialty, whether it's neurosurgery, cardiothoracics, or orthopedics if it's needed. Um, so if you're going to summarize the role of a trauma surgeon in South Africa, we can basically divide up into patient care, education, and research. Now patient care, as I said, we've got a two settings. We've got a private hospital and we've got like a private sector and we've got a government sector. And I have to show you the difference between them because it's completely, our, the, the patients we see is actually completely different. So our private sector is Mulpark Hospital. It's one of two level one trauma hospitals in Africa. Actually, The other one is Union, our private hospitals. Um, Mulpark is basically a big referral center to, to Africa and South Africa also. As you can see, they basically managed to get a level one status probably the last, for the last three years we've been the level one trauma hospital. And what they're trying to achieve with that is trying to cut down on the priority two and priority three patients. And as you can see, the, the, gradually the, the priority one patients that we receive a year is increasing. So we end up with 953 in 2014 priority one patients that we see in Mopark Hospital. And obviously it's nice being in private, you've got limited resources. It's one of the biggest private hospitals. We've got a 30 bed trauma ICU. So basically just trauma patients, 30 beds. And we've got eight beds, uh, Burns ICU also. And we basically get in, the, in December, we get like 19 local referrals and interna uh, 11 international referrals. And that's basically our international referrals up in Africa. So when you go to Kenya and you go and see all the wild animals, whatever, and stuff, the wild animal decide to attack you, will come all the way down to us and we have to resuscitate and try to save what they say. We do get often in, Africa, like places you go to game farms. I mean, I had a lady from um, from Monaco was basically impaled by an uh, elephant. Basically, his tusk went straight through her abdomen and she came all the way down to us. Now, if you look at our, our private sector, and that's why it's so much different. In our private sector, 76% of our patients we see as blunt trauma, 15% um, penetrating, and then 9% burns. And in, in our government sector, it's completely the opposite. We see about 80% penetrating trauma a lot less um, blunt trauma and burns actually depends on the season. Unfortunately in the government sector we serve the poor people and then when it becomes like winter and it's cold, people actually use very uh, poor um, techniques to keep themselves warm. So they make a fire or they use gas stoves or whatever and there's a, there's a rapid increase in the winter months in our burn patients. Now to look at a level one trauma hospital, you also have to look at the outcome. So this is the amount of priority one patients. So the top green line is basically our priority one patients in 2014 that we've seen. The bottom one is uh, priority one patients in um, uh, 2013. And the bottom line, the, the white line, the blue line, is basically the deaths we have. So you know, for all the priority one patients outcome, we actually get that um, patients we see, we have a very good outcome. And then if you look at 
um, our like expected survival and unexpected survival. So every year we ended up by between four and six percent of unexpected survivals. That actually patients, if you think, if you look at their injury severity scores, you would think they would not survive, and they actually not surviving. So I do think there's a role in trauma centres in in South Africa, um, especially. And if you think about it, like we were speaking about crowd, where everything is perfect and everything is the way it's supposed to work. We only got two um, basically private trauma hospitals in or level one um, private trauma hospitals. And if you look just like 30 kilometers down the road, we've got Pretoria. One of my friends work in casualty, and he gets two o'clock in the morning, a patient with a wide amida stinum, distended abdomen, and an open pelvic fracture. And then he basically tried, phones orthopedic surgeon, orthopedic surgeon said, no, go and get the, the, um, the jet after cardiothoracic to come and sort it out. And then the cardiothoracic will say, like, um, no, go and get uh, the general surgeon to sort out the abdomen. So, you know, unfortunately, as people qualify, they initially, when they start, they want to do all the emergency cases. And once they got the elective list, they don't want to do, come out in the middle of the night and operate. Now, the trauma surgeon, and this is a little, in, because that patient actually not dying, have none of the specialities end up coming out to see the patient. In, in a level one trauma center, the trauma surgeon will accept this patient, bind the pelvis, uh, resuscitate the patient, take the patient to theater if he needs to do a laparotomy, do extra peritoneal packing of the pelvis, and then eventually bring up all the other specialty once the patient is more stable. Now the other side of this um, is Krasani Baragwana Hospital, who is completely different. So that's like, um, yeah, we basically, we've got a very lively resuscitation area, we've got eight resuscitation bays, but we can actually ventilate 16 patients in the resuscitation area. And then we've got basically a ward, we have about 60 patients in a ward, that we basically, and the ward is called army barracks. So you can see there's all these beds and rows and rows next to each other. Now, how does it change? This is the workload we've got in, in bar a week. This is the weekly workload. We see that 800 trauma patients in the emergency department in a week. We do about 80 to 100 um, trauma ward admissions, 8 to 12 ICU admissions. We do about 80 major trauma resuscitations a week, mostly during the weekend, and if it's month and weekends, like a war zone. Um, we do about 60 trauma emergency operations a week, 15 about major, 40 in fast, 120 load of scans, 20 intercostal drains, and about 30 central lines a week. So that's our workload. So the problem is in, in the government sector, it's completely opposite. The here we suddenly have to you almost work in hostile environment, you know, it feels like as if it's a hostile environment. And part of it is also to triage your patients. So you have to walk around and triage your patients because this is a triage area. This is how it would look on a Saturday night. Just patients everywhere. And you have to decide which of them need to go into resuscitation area, which of them. And unfortunately with the numbers, you can easily miss a patient also. This is how the resuscitation look on the weekend. This is like a normal standard weekend where you basically just get easy we can have to 20 patients into the resuscitation area on the weekend. On the weekend of the, of the 16th of December, we actually had like 180 resuscitations in that week. We did, we did about 80 laparotomies, five stenotomies, and uh, five vascular cases in that week also. So it's completely different. And from us, as we do everything, we start from mates, basically, this patient was shot by a policeman with an R4 rifle, so we basically, do everything from establishing airway on these patients. So we either do um, intubate patients or we create um, <coughs> emergency tracheostomy in the emergency department if needed. We also sort of put our intercostal drains and do our breathing or resuscitation part, and then also stop the bleeding, put up high cap lines, central lines in the emergency department also. And if our patients have bed injuries, we also intubate them, do our neuroprotective ventilation, give them a monitor scan, and then we call the neurosurgeon in to come and take over the patient. But the fun part of being a trauma surgeon is the variety of the surgery we do. You know, like, and, and that makes us like more than, it's just like general surgery, so we can do a bit of everything. We can, you know, this patient came in stab, you can see where the stab wound is, you can see the chest x-ray we've got, um, you can see his heart with tensor. Um, you look on the fast, you can see the fluid, the black behind the heart, and basically this patient, we will operate in the patient for a stab heart and basically then fix the hole in the heart. The same is, you can see the gentleman's own one stab in the neck, uh, the blade is still inside, on the left hand side, and then basically we'll take him to theater to do this to not to make it proximal and distal control and do the vascular repair also. Here's a patient with a stab neck, photos catheters were inserted in his neck and to um, control the bleeding, and then we will take him to theater. Actually, the Monday was on call at Barrett, and then a gunshot neck with a common carotid interval flap also. So, I mean, that is the fun part of our surgery. You know, like we can, we basically, do a lot of different variety surgery. So 
um, stab abdomen with bowel evisceration taken to theatre, and you can see there's a hole in the small bowel just repaired. So in the abdomen, we back the pelvis, we do a safety term, we go and open the abdomen, back the four quadrants, scoop out the blood, and then we try to work towards the source of bleeding. And then, you know, um, we can screen the CVC splenectomies, we do our own distal pancreatectomies if it's necessary. Uh, livers, we suture, or we pack them if we need to, we do extra peritoneal packing, and we do all the, the vascular cases, also in the abdomen, IVCs, the um, internal and external iliac arteries, we also do ourselves common iliac arteries. And then extremities, we basically, um, pelvis, if the patient is unstable, we initially tie the pelvis. If the patient doesn't stabilize, we take the patient to theater and we do extra peritoneal packing of the pelvis. Um, we don't, unfortunately, have readily angiosuits available. So for us to get a, um, something angioembolized, we'll probably take us about two to three hours to get a, the radiologist out and to actually get the angioembolization done. So we actually have to do the packing ourselves. We do a lot of the extremity trauma also. We don't fix bones. We don't, anything we don't do, we don't fix bones and we don't operate in the brain. Um, but we, if it's vessels, we do all the vessels from subclavian, parotids, um, axillaries, brachial, um, femoral, internal, external iliac, common iliac, um, and basically everything except from popliteal down low, we actually get a vascular surgeon to do for us. And obviously fasciotomies in patients who also got like severe extremity injuries also. And then the aftercare, like we often don't have enough ICU beds, so often we end up with um, ventilated patients in our ward. So basically, mainly with most of these patients we, we look after, we obviously look for the normal complications. And often we have sort of open abdomens in our ward, the patients are excavated with <coughs> an open abdomen just with a back dressing on it. And then eventually, like the back dressings, we close, if a patient will basically keep his open abdomen, we skin graft over it, and eventually we will do component separation, also our own stomach closure also for these patients. Now the education part is, all of our consultants is ATLS instructors, so all of us do ATLS. Most of us are DSTC instructors. Um, and we train a lot of local and foreign students at any stage at Barrack One. We probably have about, I would say, anything between 8 to 14 students from foreign students, either from, um, whether from Greece, we get from England, um, Australia, we get a lot from Australia. Um, we basically come and work in our units. Um, we get our local registrars that we basically train also. We've got every day two registrars on call, a junior and a senior. Junior registrar's priority is the resuscitation area, and the senior is basically for theater and operating mainly on most of the cases, with or without the consultant, depending on the severity of the case. And then we've got a lot of foreign visitors. We actually got like a, a well set up program with the German army that Dietrich actually played a big role in. Um, so we got every three months we get in from the military service in Germany, they come and rotate through us as senior registrars. We've got now the Spanish um, um, Surgical Society also. And then um, we also got the um, Swedish also. Um, and then we get a lot of like, um, also disaster training. That guy, the grey guy, that's sitting there, Frank Blani, he's sort of in charge of disaster training um, in, uh, um, in Baraguana. And then we also play a big role in teaching in the pre-hospital. It was like a CBD I just did a week before I came here, um, basically teaching paramedics. Um, so we involved in the paramedics and pre road care also. Um, we, I'm still an external consultant for NET for the flight desk. We basically three consultants. It's me, it's a pediatrician, and it's an emergency medicine physician and an intensivist. And basically, we're available for them to find us for any advice they need if they're stuck with a patient. They don't know what to do with a patient because a lot of them, it's also fixed wing flights, so they get basically easy six hour trips, so they need to go and fetch patients. And then, to um, also, what we are available for is we go and look at all the, uh, the flight forms and we do audit them and say like which we think was optimal, suboptimal, which need to be audited and look at carefully. And then also we've been quite close involved now to introduce RSI. The, the paramedics in, in South Africa now for the last year almost are allowed to use choline, ketamine, uh, long acting muscle relaxants, etomidate on the road. But it was a process that we implemented them gradually and initially they had to find all, um, one of the three consultants before they were allowed to use these drugs. So we also used to train paramedics into the new ways and we also involved in examining the new qualified paramedics also. But it, it's not just like a, the care that we do give in, in a, a pre-hospital that we also use for education. Um, this is basically a statistic that we had at Barrett, I had the Park, and we realized that blood waste is a massive problem. 
And then I went down and sort of tracked down where we waste blood and tried to cut down on our blood. The year before, there was almost like I lost about 13 units of blood a month. And I cut it down to easy four, three units of blood. Because people order blood and it stands there. And then basically they have to return the blood and they can't use it anymore. So it's other things also that we use education for to cut down on these things. Then other problems if you also look at infections. So we look at the monthly infections. We see the patient get hospital acquired infection and then try to cut down where it is, where basically it came from. Like we had an outbreak of a pan-resistant acinetobacter, and when they went back, they actually found that the source of the pan-resistant acinetobacter was the bronchoscope that wasn't cleaned properly. And then identify the source and go back and address the source, and from then basically we can control it also. And we also got also all the data to see what's a common organism. So when you want to start someone on um, empiric antibiotics, you know it's the patient who's actually um, what's a common organism you got in your, your ICU and you know which is probably the most appropriate antibiotic to start this patient's on. And then also which is the cause, that UTI, um, uh, central line sepsis or um, surgical site infections also. So we can try to um, actually practice preventative medicine also. The other part is research and publications. That, uh, it's a big role of trauma surgeons. Unfortunately, I'm trying to get into that. I'm not really 100% committed to that yet. But if you look at a gentleman in the front row, I'm sure there's more than 150 publications between them. You know, so it's a big role. You know, and even we were actually discussing the other day. It's also for people who do who is involved in the field to go through publications and can see the fault of publications. Not everything you read is true. You know, some some publications actually have to take up a pinch of salt. And people who works in the field all the day can actually tell you like this publication is not really relevant or whatever. But um, yes. A, Book written by uh, Prof. Johannes and uh, Dietrich Toll is here uh, about penetrating trauma. So, publications is definitely part of that. Unfortunately, but, like trauma surgery is not all fun and glamour. It's also got like it takes a lot of your time, you're often very tired because from where we work, where I work in it, we basically got six calls a month. We sleep in hospital for a call, so you have a consultant in hospital um, for 24 hours, and then I still do the six calls at Mopac, so it takes quite a lot of strength. And that's me trying to do my research. Unfortunately, it doesn't go very far. Okay, and like, a big advantage of it is you can travel the world and you can actually do courses like the DSTC course where you train people. There's very few specialities where you actually go and train people all over the world. You know, if you get like colorectal or whatever, you know, there's not really much you can just you get super registrar, you get symposium. But we actually got like, we got this course that we meet all the top people in the world. You know, I'm still a young trauma surgeon and being socialized with these people is really a great honor and it really makes whatever you do great fun also. Thank you very much.